Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, my my warm greetings to uh, to Mr. McDonald and uh, huge thanks to you, Mr. Chair, for uh, for um, leading us through this meeting, which is indeed uh, the first after a long break in the room, and it's so good to see you all uh, here. Um, the topic that was chosen for this year's Resource Management Week is not accidental. Uh, it is about making sure sustainability is not an afterthought when we talk resource management. I know that uh, for us, it's always been there, and for this group, it's always been there as a critical element of the conversation, but the world is bigger than this group. And I think what this unique constellation of experts does is in fact influence the thinking and the action in the industry, uh, in academia, in the UN, and intergovernmental processes more broadly um, to the extent that we can and to the extent that all of you lend your expertise, your time, and that's why we really appreciate that you're here in person, because time is one of the most important resources we bring to the table. Uh, lend your expertise and time to make sure that this influencing is done in the most professional way and with outcomes that actually help us create a much more sustainable economy and society. So your interest and engagement is especially important now as we, the world is exiting the COVID-19 pandemic, is going through very turbulent uh, times uh, geopolitically, including due to the effects of the war in Ukraine, and is fighting for its survival when it comes to the effects of climate change. I must say that this is one group that despite not having an in-person meeting last year in this in this format has been working very hard and and uh, i'd like to pause and thank you for for this on behalf of unice all of you for the many online conversations and the work going on in the background and of course the the team of the sustainable energy division led by dario and this specific subsegment of our work uh, led by by charlotte uh, what we have achieved is quite impressive. I'll highlight just a couple of things uh, um, that are recent achievements or important developments. Um, first, um, UNFC Guidance Europe is an important milestone uh, for uh, mineral and anthropogenic resources in Europe. And uh, we hope this is a practical tool that is already being applied. Second, the importance of uh, the principles and requirements uh, document for UN resource management system. You all know about it, so I don't need to go into the details, but it is critical that we unpack this notion of integrated resource management and make it very practical for those who are ready to start applying it. Uh, and thank you very much for the contributions to these documents. Now, a major news item of the past couple of months is, of course, the fact that um, UNFC is mentioned in four areas in the draft EU Critical Raw Materials Act. And I pause here because this is a massive development. Now, of course, it's up to all of us and many others to make sure that we strategically partner with all EU member states to see through that this actually is adopted as part of the EU Critical Minerals Act. And we are very thankful to the colleagues from the European Commission for the uh, strong strategic partnership on this, uh, and we hope that all of you will support from your different angles uh, that UNFC uh, stays as an, as an important part of the Critical Raw Materials Act, which, uh, if so happens, will strengthen the EU's resilience and competitiveness in the face of the gro growing global demand and supply risks, and will, of course, be a very strong signal globally because of the influence that the European Union has globally, uh, financially and policy-wise, uh, on the uh, importance and universal nature of UNFC as a framework. We have also seen an important development elsewhere. Uh, specifically, I'd like to highlight the partnership with the African Union, which led to adoption of UNFC and UNRMS-based African Mineral and Energy Resources Management System as a continental system for resource management. And we have very promising developments in other regions, in ASEAN, Latin America, Central Asia, among others. 
So this demonstrates the relevance of the work of this group, the relevance of the UNFC, FUNRMS as instruments. Uh, and it also calls for us to take further action. And I'd like to highlight three areas uh, for the future of resource management, which I hope will be discussed during this week's meeting. First, we believe that uh, it's time to reimagine what we're doing and, and move away also sometimes from a narrow expert focus and understand that resources that we're talking about under UNFC, for example, are in fact, well, remind ourselves, we know it, but we, we need to be reminded, are a public good. And I don't need to go into the details of, of the economic theory and what that notion entails, but we need to be constantly reminding everyone that uh, recognizing and respecting the potential resources, not just from the economic point of view, but also looking at the social and environmental impact. And that the availability and accessibility of these resources is to be considered not just from the point of view of today. In fact, it is looking at the future generations and the way in which they're gonna be able to benefit from the resources that should come in focus already now. It's part of a broader look at the intergenerational equality and justice. And as you know, the UN Secretary General has launched a very strong push for an intergenerational conversation in all aspects of development. I believe this topic is no exception. And of course, of course, this is becoming ever more important as we realize how important resources, and specifically, let me highlight critical raw materials are in the efforts of the humanity to fight against the impact of climate change. You know all the facts and figures. You know that without amounts of uh, lithium and other critical raw materials um, that are currently unavailable to us, we will not be able to achieve any targets, and certainly not the 1.5 degree target. Uh, given the importance that critical raw materials play in renewable energy, in electric vehicles, in, in the deployment of hydrogen and other critical technologies and, and, and solutions that are so important for climate change mitigation. Uh, so if we don't have enough resources for solving a massive problem of today, and we are undermining the future of, of, of the people who are being born as we speak, so what do we need to do? We believe that what is needed is a model for global collaboration that is built on trust. And yet trust is probably, in addition to time, the scarcest resource we have right now. Truly, we are in, 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 in a world where, where because of the geopolitical risks, uh, countries are trusting each other less and less, and not just countries, but also private sector players. We are in a world where Trade flows are being securitized for all the good reasons. And we are in a world where global systems, uh, globalized uh, supply chains, uh, and other very, very important elements of, of globalization that have benefited the world for decades are being disrupted. Um, I hope that the UNRMS and UNFC-based work spearheaded by this group in partnership with all of you and the major players around, uh, around can be an exception, and that we can work together on a global system that is based on trust. Second point I'd like to make. We need a culture of long-term planning in resource management. Anticipation and preparing for emerging trends and challenges, so that builds on the intergenerational uh, element that I have just referred to, but it also recognizes the fact that we don't know many things that are waiting for us around the corner, be it from the point of view of effects of climate change or technology development or even economic models. And so I'm very pleased to, to see that in, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the days of, of uh, GEGRM proceedings, you will actually tackle all the fuzzy future uncertain trends in the various discussions, be it, for example, the linkages to platform economy be, for example, the importance of, of uh, new technology and digitalization. But specifically, I'd like to highlight three topics which 
co uh, co coincidentally or not. Uh, and of course, I have to thank the team for the excellent points that they have prepared. It's not me uh, coming out with all those things. But these three points, closed loop systems, intelligent resource management, and new materials, correspond very neatly to the three themes we as UNIC had just tackled in our main, main governing body, the commission session, circular economy, digitalization, and horizon scanning and future. So on closed loop systems, I don't need to tell you how important it is to minimize waste and maximize resource efficiency by reusing, repairing, remanufacturing, recycling materials at the end of their life cycle. And, a, and, a, and, a, and more generally applying a life cycle based approach including to measuring what we have, but also very importantly to an anticipating uh, the needs uh, and, and the supply. So closed loop systems can reduce dependence on primary resources, uh, lower our environmental footprint, create new business opportunities, and enhance our uh, circular economy more generally, contributing to uh, a globally, globally challenging target of in, in, you know, re ha having circular economy reach at least 15, 20%. We are currently at 8.6 or 8.9 at, 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 at the latest count in the World Circularity Report. Uh, and, and I will never forget, I think I'm, I'm, I'm repeating and repeating this in every speech I make on this topic, the insight that I learned when we, we had an excellent event co-hosted with the British government here over a year and a half ago now, um, that only 1% of lithium is being extracted from waste today. So for me, this is a 99% opportunity uh, for business, for good business, and not just acting on circularity as an environmental prerogative. When it comes to intelligent resource management, um, we obviously ne need to recognize the fact that digitalization is not something we can choose or not choose to employ. It is there, it is shaping the industry, it will happen no matter what. The question is how smart and fast we are in employing it when it comes to managing resources, uh, be it from the point of view of uh, big data, blockchain sensors, in terms of optimization, um, or in terms of uh, improving productivity, safety, and transparency, when it comes very, very importantly to, to shifting how reporting is done in extractive industries. And of course, we recognize that there is a big gap when it comes to transparency and reporting. And, and we also recognize that without transparency and reporting, according to clear standards, there is no crowding in finance, sustainable green finance at scale. And so for me, this intelligent resource management is inherently linked to the issue of financing, which is one topic that we as UNIC together with partners have been bringing to the table at COP already in Sharm el-Sheikh and plan to bring um, to the center of the discussions at COP28 in, um, in Dubai. Finally, new materials uh, and novel, with novel properties and functions that can enhance and replace existing materials. And here, uh, by looking into the future, we need to understand, you know, we need to be able to understand, we need to be able to scan the horizon and engage in strategic foresight. So I would very much encourage that this group um, make strategic foresight um, a key part of its deliberations. And, and we need to understand scarcity substitution performance, but we also need to understand the role of biomaterials, nanomaterials, graphene, and others. That may be game changers when it comes to um, industry uh, practices, and that may actually change the landscape of, of, um, of critical raw materials uh, as one topic, but more resources more broadly. Uh, finally, um, final point, third point, uh, we hope that UNFC and UNRMS can stay in focus as globally applicable systems. Uh, they are already based on, on the principles uh, covering economic, environmental, and social aspects. Um, they offer, and here is a sensitive point, and we are open about this, but we think they offer advantages over several industry systems and standards. Now, the sensitivity obviously comes from the fact that industry likes to use the standards it has and it's, um, it, you know, the evolution of those standards and systems in, from the industry perspective has its own logic, but we believe that those siloed industry systems often lack transparency, consistency, comparability, and lack of the sustainability angle to them. And we would like to create an open and inclusive conversation about how we can uh, 
ensure the evolution and using a UNFC and UNRMS as, as, uh, as a key global instrument. And of course, this expert group plays a key role in this. Uh, so once again, to reiterate, resources are public good, and that brings a lot of responsibility. Long-term planning and horizon scanning, understanding the future, and then UNFC and UNRMS as global systems, those are the three points I'd like to leave you with. Uh, we're looking forward to the good discussion, to sharing of best practices and open sharing of challenges and lessons learned. And I hope that we can uh, build not just strong expert understanding, but good partnerships out of this meeting. Uh, with this, let me wish you success and, uh, and thank once again all of you for being here and the team for their tireless efforts in organizing this week. Thank you, Mr. Marielsen, for your kind words uh, and for your long-standing support and the interest of, of the, uh, the work of the expert group on resource management. I really like uh, also, I liked everything you said, but I think the trust word and the cooperation is really important that we keep in mind. And I hope everybody engage and discuss, I shouldn't say everything during this week, that we are able to, to, uh, to communicate all the issues we would like to, to bring forward during this week. Then I would like to, well, invite, but I think we have a recording for Stinche van Weldhoven, uh, which is the Vice President and the Regional Director of Europe for the World Resource Institute. She couldn't unfortunately be here, but she will give us her speech by video. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, both for the opportunity to speak to you today but also for bringing up this topic of resource management into the spotlight. And I'm really sorry I can't be there with you today in person, but I do hope that with this video, I can spark some interest and reflection as you move forward with this crucial event. Let me kick off with a very obvious fact. We only have one planet. And although this seems very obvious and simple, our behavior on this planet seems to point out that we do not really understand what that means. But let's look at that a little bit closer. At the rate we consume, we would need 1.75 planets to sustainably provide for us all. Something is not adding up, right? We need to change that. The implications of behaving like we have 1.75 planets when we only have one are quickly piling up on us. The International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has already laid this out very clearly in one of their recent synthesis reports. So the quicker we act, the easier it will be to find solutions. And we're here today to talk about solutions. And as we speak about resource management, there's one that really pops out to me, and that's what, what I want to focus my time on, the circular economy. So why the circular economy? Because what the world needs right now is solutions that can cut across sectors, that help push forward solutions to understand the relations and the interactions within complex systems that shape our world. And I believe the circular economy is one of those solutions. Because when we speak of circular economy, we speak of a solution for social inequity, climate change, biodiversity loss, resource scarcity, job creation, and many, many more the world's pressing issues. Many of you may be thinking, okay, that sounds good, but how much is that gonna cost? And I would really argue actually that this way of thinking is something we need to change. Both government and the private sector need to see circular economy as a solution in the context of, of that irreducible effect. The world's not getting bigger, but supply chains are and will be getting more strained for a number of reasons, which you all know, which is why it makes business sense to start thinking about it, which is why it makes political sense to start thinking about a circular economy. Because Research has shown that creating a circular economy offers a 4.5 trillion economic opportunity by helping us avoid waste, stimulate business growth, and create employment opportunities. All the while, reducing the dependency of that economic growth on extraction of natural resources and critical supply chains. Creating a circular economy can create a net increase of 6 million jobs in 2030 in fields including recycling, repair, rent, and manufacturing. WRI research has also shown how bringing circular economy into the work can help relatively small businesses thrive. And of course, I'm not saying that the circular economy is a silver bullet. Anybody that tries to tell you any silver bullet, we should always be wary of. But 
We know that by incorporating circular economy principles into our approach to resource management and climate solutions, that can help us bridge solutions together to get where we need to go. To give you one example, the world is rushing to wind power as one of the solutions to the emissions of fossil fuel generated by wind. And while we know this is the right move in terms of emissions, we must also recognize that if we build this infrastructure under the linear model surely, we will reach a point where the only thing these wind turbines will be generating is problems for the local government for filling up their landfills. And this is actually beginning to happen now as turbines finish their life cycle. This is not something we can, can push back on our priority list, nor is it just a problem somewhere far away in the future. There are many more examples like this along a broad list of actions. And we must all come together to share experiences, knowledge, and set unified targets for what a successful implementation of circular economy looks like. And that is exactly what the platform for the acceleration of the circular economy aims to do. And we invite you all to learn about this and join this community of leaders that accelerates the transition to a circular economy for both human and environmental well-being. One of the key principles at ACE which I co-chair, as well as WRI, is that no one will be able to solve this on their own. We really need to work together, bring all our resources to the table, literally and figuratively speaking. Here also, I think, for example, the United Nations Framework Classification for Resources and the United Nations Resource Management System come in as international schemes for the sustainable management of all energy and mineral resources. But let me reiterate the most important point. Circular economy really is about forming new chains and new partnerships. We see this all through the economy. It actually combines partners that never used to connect. Not only in business, but also in business and the public sector and between the two. We will all need to work together to figure this out. WRI, PACE, the expert group on resource management, and everybody here should explore how to collaborate in projects share best practices, disseminate knowledge, engage stakeholders, innovate together. Let's speak to our neighbors wherever we work and ask how we can help. Let's work together to unlock the benefits of the circular economy and with it, a future in which the achievement of prosperity for people is decoupled from the destruction of that very planet, which is our home. I'm looking forward to the great things that will come out of this event and I wish you all the best and a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ms. Tintje van Veldhoven for the provoking words. Uh, then we move on and the next item on the agenda is the chair's remarks. Um, so before I do that, I uh, give the chair's remarks. I would like to introduce myself a little bit more. Again, I would like to welcome you all, whether you're here in the, the room or, or online. Um, my name is Stig Morten Knutsen. I am the chief geologist with the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate from Norway. And I'm one of the vice chairs of the EDRM. Unfortunately, David MacDonald, the chair, could not join us today in person and he regrets, uh, but he will join in as much as he can online. Uh, I will be chairing the, the session today and several of my co-chairs will be chairing the uh, the other sessions uh, later on this week, and that will be Erika Ingvall, uh, Karen Hangeu, and Teresa Ponce de Liao. And that is something that we usually do uh, when we have previous sessions of the expert group. I would again like to thank Mr. Dimitri Mariasin, the Deputy of Secretary, uh, Secretary for UNEC for joining us today and motivating us with his encouraging words. And again, I also thank Ms. Stintje van Veldhoven, the Vice President and Regional Director of Europe for the World Institutes, for highlighting the urgency of building circularity into resource management and indicating possible areas to collaborate. The UNECE Resource Management Week 2023 has a focal team, and that is assuring sustainability in resource management. We are here to discuss various issues linked to sustainability and share our insights and experiences on this topic. And even though the agenda is full, please feel free to ask questions or comment during the time allocated for the Q&As. Uh, online participants can also use uh, the chat feature to post questions, communicate with other participants or share relevant links or information or documents. 
Before we begin, I would like to highlight the importance and the urgency of sustainable natural resource management. According to the International Resource Panel, global resources extraction increased by more than 250% between 1970 and 2017, reaching a total of 92 billion tons. This has resulted in significant environmental impacts, such as greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity loss, land degradation, and water stress. Moreover, only 7.2% of these used resources were recycled in 2023. And this is according to the circular gap report from, from this year. This means that most of the resources we use ends up as waste. This is unsustainable, this is inefficient, and this poses a severe threat to our planet and to future generations. That is why we need to adopt a circular economy approach, which aims to keep resources in use for as long as possible, to extract the maximum value from them while in use, and then recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of their life cycle. A recent report from UNEP and IRP states, a circular economy can contribute to achieving multiple uh, sustainable development goals, the SDGs by decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation while creating decent jobs and fostering social inclusion. The UNFC and the UNRMS are global standards that enable sustainable management of natural resources by providing a common language and a framework for classification, evaluation, and reporting across different commodities and sectors. By adopting and implementing UNFC and UNRMS, all stakeholders, can benefit from improved transparency, consistency, and comparability of resource information, and enhance uh, decision-making, planning, and governance of resource development. The Expert Group on Resource Management, or the EGRM, as most of us know, called the group, is meeting in person after some disruptions and challenges over the last few years. But things have not been quiet. As the Deputy of Executive Secretary mentioned in the opening speech, UNFC has been included in the proposed EU Critical Raw Materials Act. We have published a UNFC Guidance Europe to support the EU member states. We have published the UNRMS, the principles and requirements, and a number of specifications and bridging documents have been updated. All of this was made possible due to the support of the European Commission and the in-kind, not the least the in-kind contributions of well over 200 experts around the world who work tirelessly on a voluntarily basis to develop and to implement standards and best practices for sustainable natural resource management. However, as we have heard from Dimitri and Stinche, the challenges are numerous, so we need to act even better and we need to act more smartly. Sustainability should be our key focus. Issues on circularity, biodiversity, social engagement, innovation, intelligent resource management, using artificial intelligence, etc., should be in the forefront of our heads. I hope that by discussing these issues, we can learn from each other and we can identify best practices and solutions for our common goals. Again, I welcome you all here today, also those who are online, and I look forward to an exciting week of discussions. Thank you for your attention and for your kind participation. Then we have been so lucky that we have uh, some fine uh, videos from the, from, the, uh, from the UK side. <laughs> so I think I'll leave it to you, uh, Francis Wall from the Campbell School of Mines to introduce it, please. Good morning. Um, thank you very much. So this uh, story starts a couple of years ago now, where we in the UK had a multi-university new circular economy, so a very topical research program, acronym NICER, starting. And my UK government colleagues uh, asked me if I'd contribute to a UN ECE session with a short talk on what we were doing in our center called Metprotec, which is about critical raw materials which of course I did with great pleasure. And I remember being so excited because I heard Teresa Ponce de Leon introducing a new draft UN resource management system. And just immediately that chimed with me that we wanted to use exactly that 
in Cornwall, where I live, where our university is, where we have several, you know, like 10 new critical minerals and geothermal projects all starting up. And we really want to get that right in this mining renaissance for our region and have the full picture of sustainable development. So we did exactly that. We took the new UNRMS and we worked with our regional government to apply it in the actual reporting and policy that we're going to use in Cornwall. And we're now ready to share that experience with colleagues. And very kindly, our UK government department of business and trade have funded a couple of videos here, which introduce the UNRMS. And that short video was filmed at the International Roundtable on Criticality Conference in February this year. We'd like to thank very much our UNECE colleagues and all the other people. You'll see some familiar faces who very kindly took part in our filming. Whether or not you're on the final cut, everybody contributed a lot of very important and useful information. And then we filmed a second interview uh, in Cornwall. And uh, you, will, you will see that, I'm not sure which way around they will be going, but uh, hopefully that case study in Cornwall will be really useful. These videos are freely available to everybody to use, and we really hope that they'll encourage people to be as excited as we were and have a go at using this new United Nations resource management system, which I think is such a nice uh, system that you can really take ownership of and use yourself. And I'm sure it can be very impactful. I hope these videos help to roll that out across the world. Here they are, hopefully. Well, we'll need to check where they, where they, uh, <laughs> they're probably, oh, here they go, here we are. UN has a convening pop. The transition to a fossil fuel free economy will require huge amounts of new natural resources, minerals, metals, and critical raw. Process and use sustainably in order to reduce their environmental and societal impacts. The United Nations Resource Management System, or UNRMS, provides the pathway for this transition. UN has the convening power to bring together the governments, the industry, the financial players, the civil society, the academia together, because we need all of them at the same table, thinking as one body one with one mind to take the correct decisions. We have to change our relationship with minerals. And we have to change our relationship with energy. And we have to do things differently. The United Nations has an opportunity. They're in a position to do something that no one else can. Developed out of the United Nations framework classification for resources, the UNRMS is a dynamic natural resource management system that can help countries, organizations, and companies support the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is based around 12 fundamental principles and accompanying requirements and is uniformly applicable to all resources. These principles are aligned around the economy, the environment, social justice and governance, as well as a suite of facilitating principles around innovation, collaboration and capability building. Each of the principles uh, is important in its own right, but obviously they've been put together as a set really to reflect the complexities of sustainable development and the sustainable development goals, which really uh, outline the aspirations of the global community uh, for the future. It's really important that we're thinking ahead and getting ready to be really agile in our supply of tomorrow's critical raw materials. Something that really help if you want to start up a new extraction operation of some kind like a mine is to have a really strong partnership with the local community. We're seeing really serious environmental issues around around mining and quarrying and around the public perception as well. 
in Switzerland, uh, we really experienced an increase in industry interest in the responsible sourcing of uh, raw materials. So India, we are a growing population. So we consume a lot and there is a lot of waste that's generated. You have to collect the waste, you have to recycle it through proper channels, through certified recyclers, and you are also telling recyclers that you extract materials out of it. Make sure you recover the value and then put it back into the new products so that you are closing the loop. The UN resource management system is offering an opportunity for us to have a global conversation about our resources, where they are, how we use them, how they can benefit society. We can set standards for what we accept in terms of sustainability, and we can set standards for what we won't accept. The UNRMS is a, is a fantastic opportunity for us to do this right and to do it in that sort of global setting where everyone is involved in the conversation, everyone is involved in the solution, and everyone benefits from the solutions that it will enable. It's a really exciting time to be in Cornwall just now for mining and mineral resources because there are multiple exploration projects for the ores of tin and tungsten and lithium, critical raw materials that we need for the energy transition. There's major clay mining still here. There's combined metals geothermal extraction being planned and deep geothermal energy too. So a whole range of resources being developed all together. We know that the energy transition means moving from an age of fossil fuels through to what is really an age of metals. We have to have them to make things like batteries and wind turbines and all of our electronics and electric vehicles function properly. If we have the resources right here in the UK, that could be really helpful. It could be a lifeline for UK manufacturing industry in the near future. So there's no doubt we have to carry on producing more material. And of course, we have to get that right. The United Nations Resource Management System is a framework that's been developed by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. This framework is a series of principles that you can use to have the sustainable development of resources in a region or on a national scale. It's not prescriptive, the UNRMS. It just provides that tick list of all the things that you need to consider in sustainable resource management. It allows companies, regional governments, national governments, all to have a common framework to work with and work within, which will help with the conversation around natural resource management, how that works in line with the sustainable development goals and also the goals around climate change action. In the UNRMS, We've simplified it to talk about the environmental aspects, social aspects, governance, which will immediately speak to mining companies who are very concerned with those things. And then we've also added circular economy. We need to make sure that the new operations for minerals and geothermal energy fit in with all the things that are going on here in Cornwall and make sure there's absolutely no pollution, in fact, nowadays, what we aim for is if you have a mine anywhere near you, it should be a positive benefit for biodiversity and the environment. Socially, we need the operations to fit in with what the people of Cornwall aspire to. We need them to provide really good, well-paid jobs for people. We need them to absolutely be in partnership with the local communities. We need really good governance. We think there's a digital way of really integrating all the information. Who can see the underground? How do we know what's under our feet? We can do that now digitally in really good 3D visualization. I think the hardest part for us to get right is what we call the circular economy. That's what we're particularly researching on. Once you've made a metal, you can keep using it and reusing it and recycling. And how we get that material stewardship right 
can we work on that right from the very first stages of production? So we really need that agenda from here in Cornwall. And that's the kind of work that we're doing in our circular economy research projects and at Campbell School of Mines. The work we've been doing with the local enterprise partnership for the Cornwall and Isle of the Scilly is around technology metals. This is an up and coming sector in the Southwest. We have a lot of exploration projects, but also a really broad range of underlying consultancies, laboratories and practitioners in the area who work both locally and internationally. Cornwall wants to have a clean, green and equitable economy moving forwards, and it has a number of strategic sectors that it would like to align. The United Nations Resource Management System works really well for this because it allows you to look at different resources in different sectors and therefore understand how you can put in actions to help grow all of those sustainably together. By applying the UNRMS, we are able to look more holistically at the system, which has allowed us to identify areas where Cornwall has strengths, but also where there are certain weaknesses. So strengths in Cornwall in the UK would be things like health and safety. We've got a really strong health and safety inspectorate. When it comes to things like strategic environmental assessments, also aspects around talent pipeline, community engagements, making sure that we understand the impact of the whole industry rather than individual projects. That's something that could potentially be worked on a little bit more. It shows that there's probably a need to do it on a more regional basis and have these things built into the sector from the very ground up. Tin mining has been a part of Cornwall's heritage and history and culture for generations and generations. And, you know, whilst obviously it's an economic decision to reopen the mine here, I think the cultural and social impact of reopening the mine could also have significant benefits in this area. It would bring back a lot of pride to an area that once was a powerhouse globally in this industry. I think a lot of people don't realise quite how significant the tin deposits in Cornwall are. They are some of the highest grade tin deposits in the world. I think we're poised that Cornwall can have a really exciting future as being a tin producing region once again. And hopefully we can start to utilize the resources that lie underneath our feet once more to be able to generate a lot of benefits for this area in a sustainable way that is to the benefit of everyone. Cornwall has some 4,000 years of mining history, but in the 1800s particularly, it was absolutely at the forefront of innovation. And we want to make sure as mining comes round again, that we are at the forefront of doing it in the absolute best possible way for everybody here in Cornwall.